with that background, let's start. I want to thank Professor Benham Desfouli for getting the room for this. He is the Associate Professor of Computer Engineering at SCU. Alec, can you use the microphone, please? Benham is the Associate Professor of Computer Engineering at SCU and also the Chair of IEEE CompSoc Santa Clara Valley. And I will introduce very briefly Adil Kidwai, who is the Head of uh, Product Management. And he is going to describe EdgeQ's journey as a startup, uh, attracting money and going from uh, the stealth mode into open mode, attracting customers, shipping product, and also describe his 4G, 5G base station slash Wi-Fi on a chip with some AI capabilities that we're going to learn about today. Adil, it's all yours. Thank you, Alan. Use this. Hello, everybody. Uh, can you guys hear me? Good. Okay. Is mic working? Okay. Um, so uh, let's get started. I think I will not use this. So a little bit of the introduction of let me assume this. A little bit of the introduction of the company. Um, we were founded in 2018 by this gentleman named Vinay Ravuri. Um, I am the head of products. Um, also in the slide you see my partner in crime, Hari, who is the head of silicon engineering. Um, around 95% of the company is hardcore modern development technical people. Um, the rest 5% are people like me and Vinay and I have been in the industry for 25 years doing a lot of developments for modern platform architecture, modern physical layer development. Um, we are around 250 people now. How many? 250. And how many are in Bangalore and how many are here? I would say around 70, 30, 70% in Bangalore, 30% in the US. Yeah. Um, but silicon engineering is done in Bangalore. No, no, not uh, it's it's all divided between okay. Bangalore and US. Hopefully that will come out during your presentation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in addition to the immediate family, we also have an extended family. Um, Paul and Matt, who use who need no introduction, they have been the CEO and CTO of Qualcomm, are our advisors. Um, Ajit, who is who was. Um, who, who held a definitional role with the U.S. government on uh, the CBRS band open opening? Um, uh, he is also our advisor. As I mentioned, we have 250 people. We have raised around 120 million dollars so far uh, from a bunch of investors, and we are in full production. It has this is the sixth year of sixth year of our journey, and. We are growing at a very fast pace, 300 percent year over year in terms of revenue. We all we already have revenue high single digit millions. So, yeah, I mean we have as a as a journey of a, let's say think about a startup as a child. We are we started crawling in 2018 and now we are we learned walking. We are we are we are not a very 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 early startup anymore. Right? We are we are growing very fast. Um, with 250 people, a significant headcount now. Uh, I'll introduce a, the product in a in a minute. Um, but before I do that, um, how many people here are from wireless communication background? Any guys? Oh, all of most most of you. <laughs> okay. So wireless communication is very hard technology. Um, when I present these slides to a bunch of people, investors, a lot of them don't even understand or know how to spell modem. Uh, you, can, you can empathize, sympathize with um, wireless startup because everybody knows what AI is, everybody knows what an autonomous car is. Modem is very, you know, kind of dark art. Not a lot of people can do this. Not a lot of companies in the world know how to develop a modem. And the reason is, um, it is an amalgamation of a lot of different things which are very complicated in, uh, in their own uh, uh, fields. 
for example, it requires very, very hardcore mathematics. I wouldn't say it hard mathematics, it's hardcore mathematics, um, requiring information theory, um, uh, representation learning, a lot of estimation, probability, a uh, lot of things like that, right? Uh, then it also involves hardcore engineering. Like you need to know the chip design, the nuances of the chip design, power consumption, um, how to make sure you tape out something to a foundry which works and not make like, stupid mistakes, um, uh, advanced signal processing, uh, advanced CPU design. Uh, so that, is, that it itself is, in, is, is, a, is a big field. And then the third and most important thing in wireless communication is um, this is kind of somewhere close to an art, not a science, because you are dealing with you know different types of environment. Think about your cell phones right now. Right, your your your, your cell phone is getting a signal inside this room. Uh, the tower which this cell phone is connected to right now may be a few miles away somewhere. There would be trees in the middle. There would be buildings in the middle. There would be what not. Right. Uh, so it's almost kind of you know, although it has become a device which every one of us has, but it's like magical, right? Uh, inside this room, sitting here, you can talk to somebody, you know, across the ocean. Um, can I ask you to yes. elaborate on one point? Of course, it's very hard, but I make the point that it is. Can you comment on the fact that it's much higher? in the wireless base station than in a single endpoint because you have to terminate so many more wireless channels. I can use this. I can use this. Both endpoint and base station. Yeah. Uh, Comment uh, on how much more difficult it is to do wireless communication engineering in a base station where you have to terminate multiple wireless communication endpoint channels. Yeah. So I would say that the challenges are different in both base stations and terminals. Um, I spent around 20 years making modems for cell phones before getting into base stations around six years ago. The challenges are completely different. Uh, in this device, in this world, the challenges are power consumption. This thing has to last for 24 hours on its own, right? You don't want to charge your phone 10 times a day. Uh, this, this device also needs to be in an environment like like this, for example, right, where you are sitting in a, inside a building where uh, there is literally no signal coming here, right, uh, or very weak signal. So this device has to decipher the signal that is coming to you, right. Uh, so the challenges on this device is different. Challenges on the base station is completely different set of sets of challenges because you can have thousands of these phones connected to a base station, which means the capacity has to be super high. That's the key. The key point is capacity. Yeah, so the capacity has to be super high. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, a base station um, also has to consume power. Somebody has to pay the power bill. So power consumption also is a, is a uh, OPEX spending of base station is a, a, a big uh, item in the total spend. So although both this phone and a base station which it's connected to are both modems, the, 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 the basic functionality is the same, but the challenges are very different. And both are equally tough to make. <laughs> I would say both are very, very hard technology to make. Okay. Uh, and, and here we are, I'm, I'm showing you a 5G modem inside a cell phone, a 5G chip inside a cell phone. Um, you know, think about it, without this 5G chip, the cell phone would be a brick, right? It wouldn't do much without it. So it's kind of an enabling technology for, for uh, a lot of us and most of the world's population. And we take it for granted because everyone has it, but this is this is super complicated to make. For those of you who are in the wireless field, would would understand what I'm saying. So, um, what we do is um, we make base station in the chip. Um, so, as Alan pointed out, we play in the wireless infrastructure market, uh, the base station market. Um, we are not in the cell phone yet. Um, now, what is a base station and a chip? So I don't know, many of you might have noticed when you are on the freeways, you might have seen cell phone towers with tall antennas on the towers, right? Uh, or, or, or electric towers where they rent the space to put antennas. Uh, the antennas look like this, as you see in the picture. 
Uh, what you don't see is uh, at the base of the antenna, at the base of the tower, you, there is all, there's kind of a huge box, right? And that box is the one which is doing a lot of baseband processing. Uh, if you think about a, a wireless, pers from wireless perspective, what all functions need to happen in a wireless, uh, do we have a pointer anywhere? Adam, is there a pointer? No pointer, sorry. I don't see it. No, I don't see it. Uh, yeah. Any case. Um, can you use a tap? I think I can just wind something here. So, on this picture, I'm showing you the, the full um, transmit and receive chain. So, on the top, think about it like there are RF signals coming in at very high frequency, you know, 3 gigahertz, 4 gigahertz, 5 gigahertz. You down convert the RF signal to a baseband frequency. Baseband frequency means your channel bandwidth frequency, right? 100 megahertz or whatever. Um, then you do all these functions, right? You do sample processing, channel prefix addition, uh, and then you do a Fourier transform, inverse Fourier transform or, or fast Fourier transform, uh, depending upon the transmitter received. If you are doing beam forming, then you do beam forming functionality after that. Um, then you do a bunch of very hardcore layer one, what we call physical layer mathematics, uh, like uh, you know, rate calculation, uh, layer mapping, uh, scrambling, encoding, uh, and stuff like that. Um, after that, you convert. You have converted. You have success successfully converted your RF symbols to to bits, transport blocks. Then you go to the MAC and the RLC processing, and then you go to PDCP and RRC. Uh, I won't go into detail of what each one of these blocks do. You can Google them. It is fairly standard uh, uh, functionality. What is not standard is how HQ has um, has has uh, uh, implemented these functions inside a chip. So what we did was we um, said, okay, inside all these functions, which type of processor is preferred for each type of function. Uh, typically what you see is, okay, I have a bunch of functions and I will run them on x86 or one type of processor. Or you say that I have a bunch of functions, I'll run them all, them, all of them on ARM uh, processor. Or you can say I have a bunch of functions, I'll run all of them on to RISC-V processor. Uh, what we did was, we said, okay, let's see which processor is good for which functions. Uh, and we decided that for layer one processing, everything from top until until here, uh, we said that we want we want open architecture. Um, we want to be able to write our ISA instructions. Um, we want to be able to write functions. Therefore, we chose a RISC five architecture for layer one. Okay, um, and then we said for packet processing and higher layers. Um, it is better done in a generic processor like ARM. So, to my knowledge, we are actually one of the first companies who actually married these two type of processors into the same silicon. We did not take sites that, okay, I'm a RISC-5 company, I'm an ARM company, I'm an x86 company. We said, let's, let's find out what is best for each function and let's, put, let's, let's do the right thing for the, for the entire chain, right? Uh, so, this is the cartoon diagram of a chip. We are selling this chip into tens of thousands already, so this chip is in full production. Uh, in addition to the compute complexes, we have some accelerators like FEC, uh, encoder, decoder, accelerator, protocol accelerators, security, uh, and RF interface. So this is kind of how we thought about this whole thing. We, we uh, yes, two questions. Why don't you go first? What kind of ARM CPU are you using? Sorry? What kind of ARM CPU? Yeah, this is Neoverse E1. Oh, Neoverse. Yeah, Neoverse E1. We have a bunch of them, actually. We have nine ARMs. Can you repeat the question? What is the ARM CPU you are using? Um, yeah, so we have uh, 18 of them in this chip, uh, running at around 1.5 gigahertz, each one of them. Yeah. 
you had also a question yeah uh, so have you integrated rf also into the chip because rf is a different silicon actually processing and so i'm just wondering how you manage rf in the same chip as digital rf is not integrated data converters are integrated so adc and dax are integrated here in this block uh, rest of the rf is outside we use off the shelf rf ics yeah it, because it so says you just, rf is having an rf interface oh no interface components. yeah yeah this is rf ief interface well, it's a baseband chip okay so it's, it's only the, the uh, rf is off chip with that interface yeah right? yeah so, so we do, if you think about this picture, right, the top box is called RF, right? <laughs> that we don't have with this chip. After that, everything is inside this chip. Okay. And where is the uh, digital front end actually happening? In this, in this part, RF interface. So the data converters are here. So what we get from the RF chip is an analog IQ signal. I guess you could think of it as a A to D converter. Uh, no, no, uh, that is data converters. No, yeah. no, I'm very familiar with this. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, it, uh, what, I, uh, what I mean is that digital up conversion, down conversion, crest factor reduction. Yes, crest factor reduction, DPD, everything is happening yeah, here. Yeah. Yes, here. inside the chip. So what we get from the RF chip is analog IQ signal at baseband frequency, 100 megahertz or 200 megahertz, whatever signal bandwidth is. Then we take it, do the DDC, DUC, what you call digital up conversion, down conversion. CFR, DPD, all the algorithms, DC offset correction, IQ imbalance, all these corrections are happening inside here. Mm. So that's a mic and a nick layer. Sorry? That's a mic and link layer. That is what? Mac layer. Mac layer is, happens way after that, right? What we are talking about is that part, Mac layer is here. So the signal comes from the RF analog interface. You <coughs> take it to a data converter. It converts it into bits. Then you remove the cyclic prefix. Then you do the FFT. Then you are in frequency domain. And then you do whatever you want to do with it. Okay. So you're showing here, high Mac and all that. Right? Correct. Correct. Yes. So different functions run on different processors. Yes. And so you need to transfer the data, exchange the data between these processors. Correct. Are you using any, part, any, any proprietary kind of communication protocol between Basically the processors the or yeah, you know, I, have a hard time I think let me repeat your question <laughs> let me know whether I got it right you are saying different functions are being done in different processor how do the processor communicate with each other is there a proprietary protocol right okay so until this point this is done in RISC-V all of this is done in RISC-V this is done in ARM this layer is defined in 3GPP uh, uh, FAPI small cell forum. It's called FAPI. So this is a this is the industry standard proprietary protocol. It's just that we are inter we are doing this protocol inside the chip, not two chips. Typically, one of our key value proposition. Also, I'll come to you one. Just one second. Uh, one of the key value proposition that we have is, if you open a small cell infrastructure box right now, you will find one chip doing this, the other chip doing this. And they are connected on a, a, a PCI interface or a Ethernet interface on the board. We have this inside the chip, which saves a lot of power as well. What was the name of that interface again? FAPI. F A P I. A small cell forum. That's a small cell forum, standardized interface. Everybody uses that. It's, uh, not our invention. Let's, let's move on. Please keep your questions. Just for clarification, uh, let's say what is this acronym or what is that acronym? There's one more question, yes, sir. Well, I had a question on memory, so then does that mean that it's shared memory? Yes, yes. Is it on chip or off chip? No, so basically between these two, uh, we we have a DDR which is sitting outside, which is not showing here. So it is go, goes to DDR and comes back. Yeah, because the data is so much, we have around 50 megabyte of on chip SRAM. Uh, but that is not enough for the kind of data throughput that we are pumping through. We are pumping roughly 10 gigabit per second from this chip user throughput. So, yeah. okay, no questions, so let's move on. Yeah, so this is the silicon, and this is highly integrated silicon, does the entire, pretty much, except RF, the entire ran into the same silicon. Okay, let me talk about 
the challenges in this market. And then I will talk about how our product solves these challenges. The silicon you just saw, I will describe how it solves these challenges. So infrastructure market is also a very fragmented market. Um, on the left side, you see these two are kind of the big macro cell. Macro cell means the cell that you see on the cell phone towers, uh, the big macro where your cell phone is connected right now. The left three are what we call small cells. Um, so you can have enterprise small cell, you can have outdoor, indoor, fixed wireless, remote access small cells. I have written specs for each of those, some high level specs. And from specs, you can see that they are vastly different products. Uh, a macro has to have very high capacity. A, on this side, you are looking at very, very low power consumption sometimes power, powered over ethernet. You don't have the, the luxury to have a, a, a power cable to these boxes. Um, and then number of users, these small cells typically cater lesser number of users. This, this guy caters like thousands of users. Uh, typically, there is significant beam forming here. These are indoor device, not much beam forming happening. Data throughput is very, very low on that side, super high on this side. Uh, so then we are scratching our head and we said, you know, there are many types of applications, many requirements. A tiny startup like HQ, we, uh, we don't have the luxury to make 10 different types of silicon. Uh, for those of you who come from silicon world, you will, you will know that making silicon is a very costly affair, right? It takes roughly two to three years uh, to make a silicon, uh, you know, tens of millions of dollars. Um, and just to give you a data point, um, the latest three nanometer process technology, one tape out cost $22 million. So you tape out once, you give TSMC $22 million, okay? In $22 million, you can have 10 software companies <laughs> founded and, 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 and uh, run, right? So this is, this is a very hard business in terms of uh, uh, capital investment. So the question was, do we use separate silicons for all these? We don't have the capacity or the money for that. Um, so the, 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 uh, uh, the outcome of that brainstorming was, we need to have a silicon which is programmable. Uh, a silicon which we can program. Once we program it, it can function as that one or you load a different firmware, it runs at this one. Does, is this really doing anything? I'll shut it off. <laughs> Let me know if you can't hear me. So um, one other phenomena that we are say, seeing was the entire world was on 4G until at least three, four years ago uh, when, we were, when, when, when our startup was founded. And the world was moving to 5G. So we were in the middle of this 4G to 5G transition. So we had to support 4G and we had to support 5G. Cost structure of 4G was super low. Cost structure of 5G was high because 5G is some five, six times data throughput as compared to 4G because the bandwidth is higher and you, you know some of that. Uh, so these were some of the challenges. Another challenge that was thrown on top of all that is the open RAN movement, right? Everybody was talking about open RAN. Let's desegregate the RAN, are you, one vendor, uh, DU, the other vendor, CU, the third vendor, software, this disaggregation at every level. Uh, so the obvious choice for us was to select a silicon or to make a silicon which was programmable, which we could, which could morph from one shape to the other as the requirements and the solution and the application change. What is the, uh, what is the power represents that for the Power consumption, yeah, power consumption, the numbers here uh, uh, is the power for the chip inside it, yeah. not the box. This box typically is powered by, by Ethernet. So this has Ethernet, uh, the, the uh, PoE++ plus plus limit, which is 25 watts. So power consumption was also a very important consideration. <coughs> Another challenge that we, we faced was uh, the cost challenge, right? And that is denoted in this slide. Uh, so what was happening was there were a lot of incumbents in the market, right? Uh, like Ericsson, Huawei, Nokia. Uh, 
these guys historically were not a big proponent of open ran at that time uh, the proponent of open ran were new companies who were going into this market these companies were not new per se but they were going into this new market like intel qualcomm marvel um, the problem was that the solutions which were based on these <laughs> companies was roughly 5000 10000 dollars a pop the traditional guys were selling this for 2 to 3000 dollars so we knew four or five years ago the open ran challenge and the challenge still exists that the open ran solutions are finding hard to compete with the incumbent cost structure although the incumbents are very closed proprietary um, so operators wanted freedom to choose between different components but if the if the if they have to pay like 3x or 4x of the cost then you know you eventually choose freedom or you eventually choose dollars um, five years ago we know that a lot of people are choosing dollars so we devised this solution which could compete with these guys and be roughly half or less than half the cost of the those companies yes acronyms tam what do you mean by that tanga alpha my total available market or total it's a commercial term i i not technical yes i i forget i'm in in a university yes that's all right Okay, and this is a big market. This is like the Ericsson, Nokia market. Uh, you know, uh, uh, this is these are the kind of the big incumbents in this market. Uh, the new guys were not very successful because of the cost. The our cost sector is in the range of the incumbents, so that's something also <laughs> where people say, okay, if we go with HQ, we get lower cost as in the as compared to the incumbents, and we get openness. So best of both the worlds. Right? Uh, so, as I mentioned, we play in these three markets. One is that market where we, we play in the small cell enterprise outdoor market. Think about that as an appliance box, like a big, like your Wi-Fi Wi-Fi router kind of box. This is the macro market. and this is the newest market which is called non terrestrial network market i i i don't know whether you guys know this maybe somebody is doing research in this industry on this but you have must have heard about spacex starting you cannot <laughs> you guys must have heard about spacex starting where you get wireless from the from the sky right from the leo and geo satellites so we play in that market as well to increase the capacity into this market we gang up multiple chips so there are three sq chips gang together they can talk to each other and they increase the capacity of the overall solution right so uh, these are three markets that we play in uh, this is a cartoon diagram of our silicon i described before there is arm complex in this and there is this five we provide the full physical layer physical layer means the remember we talked about channel prefix subtraction and addition fft and uh, accelerator uh, 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 forward error correction and so on and so forth and then we also provide layer 2 layer 3 software which means scheduling of all the users uh, scatter gather functionality mac pdcp rrc yes you have a question yeah you mentioned that you actually uh, you know a scale based on a few chips mm -hmm. how do you distribute the uh, task among those chips good question so the scaling based upon chip happens in this world typically what happens is there are three sectors in this world or six sectors in this world we have one common scheduler for all the sectors which is running on one chip the physical layer is distributed among the two other chips that's how we do it and these two chips talk to each other because in the physical layer implementation you have to share beam forming components sometimes between the carriers so uh, the two chips uh, can talk via a very fast ccix interface running over pci uh, 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 transport so that's how we do it one scheduler layer one uh, across two chips yes you go <laughs> uh, since you implement the mac layer on the software uh, does it Comes slower. What does the perform performance in terms of 
Can can you speak louder, please? Uh, since the Mac layer is on the software, software. Yes. So the performance does it go to it? Like uh, if you uh, terminate the the Mac layer on the AC, would have better performance. Mac layer on the AC. 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 I see. So Mac layer. If you if I go back into this into this uh, into the chip picture, a lot of good questions. Um, the scheduler runs on the ARM, which is a fully software function. Uh, there are accelerators for Mac layer as well. So this protocol accelerator unit, it accelerates some Mac functions and some like scatter gather. Uh, the crypto function is accelerated. So software plus hardware, this is kind of a mixture of both, depending upon what, where we wanted to uh, freedom to change the code and where we said hard coding is good enough. I actually have a slide later in the thing where I talk about uh, hard coding versus soft coding. So, so yeah, I mean, we play in these three markets. As you can imagine, for a startup, it's very important to not put all your eggs in one basket. You know, who knows that basket may, may not may not pan out. Um, so, we design a silicon which is programmable, which can go into these three markets. Uh, most of our revenue comes from this market right now. Uh, the first one, the this guy. Well, why don't you break it down between enterprise and telco? Sorry, what is it? Why don't you break it down between enterprise and telco? Because enterprise exclusively. Yeah, around around network and telco is both private and public. Around around uh, 70, 30, say 70, 70 percent revenues come from private market. Yes, small amount. Seventy percent in that space is private uh, network and 4G, 5G, and 30% is public. Correct. Good. Let me just point out one thing. It's extremely difficult for any startup to sell to an established base station uh, vendor. There's like five of them, right? Huawei, Ericsson, Nokia, ZTE, and Samsung. And they've been doing this for years. They have hundreds of man years invested in their own design. They're not gonna just throw that away to buy a startup's base station on a chip. So, correct me if I'm wrong, HQ has to go after new players. Yeah, we go after, I mean, these are uh, our competitors, actually. What you, I mean, Ericsson, Huawei, we compete with them. They have their own silicon. They have yeah, their I'm own. I'm gonna ask you that, like, who exactly do you sell to? Because you don't make the box, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we don't make the box. Yeah, but what he's saying is that Huawei and Samsung, for sure, maybe others, make their own base station. No, I get that. And yeah, that's why I'm, I'm asking not, him, like, who not, do you exactly sell to? And it's not sold on a virtual market. It's used internally in their boxes. Yeah, yeah. I, I'll answer your question. I get your question. Uh, we, we sell to ODMs and OEMs who, who, de, who, de, who deploy uh, private 5G into um, private networks. Um, and, and all these big companies that you mentioned, they are our competitors, actually, as you can yeah. see. That, that's it's to be expected. Yeah. yeah. A lot of private 5G is coming up all over the place, but the big companies, they need it. They need it for them. That's right. But then these guys would be in that space as well. It's not like they're going to ignore it. So yeah. they will be in that space. However, that's where the innovation of a startup comes into picture, mm -hmm. right? Uh, we can do things which these, these companies have not even thought of. <coughs> Uh, a lot of things that I am not disclosing here, uh, features which private 5G market requires. Um, uh, that's where the agility of the startup comes. In our comparative analysis, we are running at least two years ahead of these big players in some key features. Uh, and the reason is we listen to our customers and we, we act fast. Uh, I used to work in a big company and every time a feature needed to be developed, there will be a gazillion dollars needed, 500 people needed. and three years needed for that. <laughs> now we do this with two people and one month and you know, a few hundred thousand dollars. So yeah, so, so we found this space as a very crowded space in terms of there are a lot of incumbents, but you use that as your strength. We use that as our strength. Um, our customers tell us that every time I ask for a feature to these incumbents, you know, there are thousands of meetings I have to sit through, convince somebody, and then they will give me a long schedule. And with you guys, I come and it just works. It just happens in three months. So 
Yeah, I mean, startup got to have this agility and, and therefore the advantage. Plus the programmability help, right? The, the custom silicon in many of these other things is that's not right, that's right. programmable that's right. to that degree. Yeah, they have custom silicon. Every time a new application comes, they have to spin the silicon. So your, your ticket size you see at the table is like $50 million. Um, programming interface proprietary too or do you use something like P4? No, C, C, C++. Plus plus. Okay. We just that's give our customers, they can program it. Yes, you had a question? Just clarification, a third the power half the cost compared to what? Compared to the please closest... Repeat, please repeat all the questions, especially since it's uh, yeah. I can't even hear uh, his, his question is, a uh, third of the power half the cost as compared to what? Right. So, as compared to the closest competitor in this space, the smallest space... So would that be, would that be like uh, Huawei, ASIC? Or yeah, ASIC? yeah, Ericsson ASIC, Ericsson ASIC, Huawei ASIC. As compared to this space, where the open RAN is, is primarily driven by Flex RAN, which is an Intel x86 based solution, our power consumption is actually one tenth because we are custom ASIC as compared to x86, a, a general process processor. Right? So, this is a conservative number, the, the smallest one. Uh, we have like our customers telling us this box, that the, the enterprise small cell box, runs with PoE plus plus power, 25 watts, that is the limit. Our closest competitor is running like 65, 70 watts, so 3x, 4x numbers. Very, it's, it's widely different. Maybe one more question. So, how much of that would you say is due to the architecture versus how much due to, say, just the process? So, we don't play on process technology node. We don't have that much money to go to 3 nanometer or 2 nanometer process node. We are in an older process technology node. One thing that worked for us is a lot of the company, including myself, spent majority of our careers designing modems for phones, which means we knew all the tricks in the world for the power consumption, power saving, uh, architectural power saving, clock getting, how power getting is done, stuff like that. We brought all that knowledge from that world to this world. Uh, we did not play on process technology. Um, still, we are roughly one third of the process, our, our power consumption as compared to the competition. That should also tell you that when we go to the, we still have a lot of room left. Because I can always go to the higher process technology you know, and, and skill the power consumption problem, right? Uh, even if it's there. So there's a lot of room. You have to tell us who your TSMs are in TSMs. TSMC. TSMC. And what node are you at at TSMC? Uh, I choose not to disclose it here. <laughs> <laughs> but not very aggressive process technology node. Uh, we are still in, in double digit process technology node. I will leave it at that. Yeah, we are not seven or five. We have both the nodes, the ASIC as well as RF, the same nodes, or it's different? Sorry? We have the baseband as well, RF in the same node, or it's different nodes? Baseband and? and RF. RF. RF is a separate chip. We, we work with partners for RF IC. We don't have a RF chip of our own. Yeah. We have data converters in the, inside this chip, as I mentioned earlier. The ADCs and DACs are inside this chip. Sorry. Can you repeat the question? Yes. Yeah. So, do you develop your own physical layer and uh, L2 uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. software, or you allow, like you know, your customer? No, to... no. So we develop what we sell is this silicon and the physical layer. This goes hand in hand. Um, layer two, layer three. We give our customers an option. They can use our layer two, layer three, or they can use their own. Uh, but physical is always ours because it's so tightly coupled with the hardware. Uh, it doesn't make sense for somebody else to run their physical layer on the silicon. We are not the kind of. A when you say, I mean, you talk about programmability. Yes. Then, what kind of like you know configurability you allow your customer to do? Yeah. Hold on for two slides. I will answer this question. If I don't, then please remind me. That's okay. Yeah. yeah. yeah okay. So. Somebody asked earlier, I think you asked earlier, um, what, is, what is the right mix of hard versus soft inside a silicon, right? Uh, it depends on the processor and the functions that you are implementing. In our case, we have a bunch of soft coded functions uh, which are running onto a, a RIS-5 processor. We have a bunch of software plus hard coded function which for which we have extended the ISA and we have developed a micro code for that. 
and then there are hardware state machines. For example, FEC is accelerated in hardware. Uh, things where you don't anticipate changes, like LDPC is will remain LDPC no matter what. A Viterbi accelerator, you know, polar decoder will remain polar decoder no matter what. There's no need for it to be soft. But uh, channel estimation, a lot of customers want their own channel estimation algorithms. Uh, there is merit in keeping channel estimation soft. Uh, layer mapping, a lot of beam farming. There is merit on keeping these functions soft. So we kind of, I mean, these are some example functions. Uh, for example, these ones, right? Uh, uh, crypto acceleration, for example. Uh, not much programmability is required as long as you support all the algorithms in crypto, right? Uh, those ones, you need a lot of soft programmability because customers may ask you that I want my own, for example, think about AT&T and Verizon. Depending on the deployment, let's say AT&T is deploying a, a base station in, in a very dense environment. Um, their channel estimation algorithm needs to be different for that because a channel is different in a dense environment. Versus let's say there's an AT&T tower in a remote village, channel is going to be different for that. Their channel estimation algorithm are different for this environment, which means there cannot be a hard-coded channel estimation, otherwise they will need to use, to use two separate chips. One for dense environment in urban area, the other for uh, a, a remote environment. So we have been doing this kind of for the last 20, 25 years. So we know which functions customers would ask uh, to be programmable. We know which functions the customers will not ask to be programmable. Like, so, so this is kind of the, the division of, so to say, soft versus hard. Um, and then you can see a bunch of benefits. Right? Uh, you, can, you can program it, um, the functions you want, you can use your own channel estimation algorithm. One of our customers, who is a very big operator, came to us and said, you know what, I want to buy your entire physical layer and chip, but I want to use my own channel estimation algorithm. Um, they could repeat that activity. Sorry? Could you just repeat that? Please repeat what you oh, repeat. Uh, one, one operator came to us. Um, they wanted to do uh, a private 5G network. And they said, I want to use my own channel estimation algorithm. I don't want to use yours. Not that your, yours is inferior, but I have some secret sauce in my channel estimation algorithm. If I had hard-coded channel estimation here, then I would need a different chip for that, right? That is two years of, again, work. But we have soft-coded this channel estimation, so we said, okay, you know, I'll pull it out of my physical layer. You can put it in yours. I'll give you an API to, your, to use your algorithm. So that's and like a semi-custom chip then? The chip is semi-custom already. Uh, you can use... But you're essentially, through an API, allowing your customer to... Change functions. To microcode it. Yes, yes. It's very interesting. Right? Um, and, and that is one of the key value proposition of HQ, uh, Silicon, and Solution, that the customers have the freedom to use their secret sauce without telling us what In this case, the operator had their own channel estimation algorithm. Yes, and yes. They coded it, and then they accessed your instruction memory through your API. Yeah, so, so, yeah, so your, this answer to this question and your question is in this slide. Very impressive. All right? Um, so, what is the secret sauce of HQ? A lot of people ask me, you know, this startup is going on for six years. We are reasonably successful so far. What is the secret sauce? The secret sauce is this slide. So this is the silicon. We talked about that before. Uh, one monolithic silicon does ARM and TXU complex. TXU complex is the RIS-5 complex. Uh, this has 16 RIS-5 processors, one six, where the entire physical layer runs. Okay. Now, zoom in. One one processor out of 16 looks like this. What we, we call it TXU, tensor execution unit. Tensor because these are three-dimensional vectors that we have to, to do mathematical operations on. If you buy a RIS-5 processor right now, if you, if you call Andes or sci fi you will get this, this guy, this what we call scalar unit. This is what you'll get from the market. Uh, but RIS-5 gives you ability to extend the ISA. The instructions and architecture, you can, you can extend it. No other processor in the world gives you that ability. Right? If you go talk to ARM or Intel x86 guys and say, I want to add a custom instruction, you know, good luck. <laughs> Three years after that, you'll get your custom instruction. RISC-V can do this. That's why RISC-V is gaining a lot of traction. 
So this is kind of the arithmetic unit is that custom instruction extension that you may you may you may think of it like that, right? By doing that, we wrote around 150 custom instructions, 150, and we do all the layer one functions into this file, like FFT, uh, uh, modulation and decomposition of matrix, nonlinear functions, challenge estimation, equalization. All those things are happening on this five by the instructions that we have extended. Okay, um, so that is kind of the secret sauce. Now, if somebody wants a different channel estimation algorithm, all I have to do is take out mine and put their instructions in, right? Or sometimes we develop the instructions for them, but depending upon their secret sauce, right? Um, if they are programming at C, C plus plus level, they can't get to this level of. No, they cannot. We recommend them. We recommend that they don't get to this level. <laughs> yes. So we give them API, and we write the microcode for that, and they instantiate that microcode as a library in their function in their C code, right? This is uh, written in assembly. Sorry. Yeah. This is assembly full. Full assembly. Yeah. Yeah. There has to be a translation from their C C plus plus through your interfaces correct. to the actual code, right? Correct. Correct. Um, yeah, so so that is that is how we kind of crack the problem of programmability versus hard code, right? Uh, this all the instructions in physical layer are running at a bare metal level. There is no operating system here, so this is just bare metal, very stateless machine, very stateless function, very very cost, very very power optimized. You asked about power consumption, uh, how we get to good power consumption. I gave you one example, one reason. Uh, we have just a lot of uh, kind of uh, experience in this low power consumption chip design. The other one is this. Uh, these custom instructions, we control when these custom instructions are executed. We control symbol to symbol functionality. So, you know, in a, in a slot, there are like 14 symbols. Every symbol we know what to do and what not to do. We shut off these custom instructions on a symbol level granularity. And that is another roughly 50, 60% of power consumption improvement comes from this. Very, very tight control of layer one, right? As compared to a generic processor where you have a function, it just runs and you don't even know who's, which, op which function is doing what. Here we know exactly on which symbol, which processor is active for which carrier, for which PRB. Uh, um, so, so very, very tight control of, uh, yeah, your question? Yeah, so uh, you mentioned about you know scalability. Yes. Now my question is that you know when you have like a hard coded LDPC uh, coder, mm -hmm. encoder, decoder, then how do you actually like you know for example depending on the capacity that you need to support, mm -hmm. you know scale up or scale down the number of instances <laughs> of LDPC. Because in this case, how do you do the parallelism, mm -hmm. things like that, that is needed actually to increase yeah. the capacity? So this chip supports up to 10 gigabit per second of user throughput. We have enough LDPC instances to cater 10 gigabit per second. If the use case does not require 10 gigabit per second, we don't use all the LDPC, we power gate all of them. OK? Now, you can argue that your LDPC is still in the silicon. It's not used. Uh, that becomes a gross margin problem for us. Uh, nothing more than that, right? Because we power get it. There's no power consumption, extra power consumption. Um, it is there in the silicon. We just don't charge for it. Make sense? Yeah, uh, you know, uh, it does make sense. But you know, it's kind of, uh, you know, contrary to this notion of virtualization and the fact that you know you containerize and then you have like you know instantiate like you know different containers on x86 or arm or whatever depending on how much capacity you want so like you know one instance of fdpc versus few instances yeah. so you don't have that it's all in a, a, a uh, it's hard coded. You it's, know, this is what we had in all in, links, you know, because it's you know, all in the silicon. We do support containers, all the containers, dockers, everything on the on the ARM processor. They can instantiate layer one as much as they want. Uh, for example, they can instantiate only one LDPC or three LDPCs. 
what you are talking about is kind of an extreme world of general general processor where you have containers you can instantiate something or the other but then you pay 5x of cost and 10x of power consumption exactly i was just right. going to say that that's so, where you that's where the cost comes in correct. you can't optimize everything correct so the cost is going to blow up yeah so so if you want if you want a generic code to be run where you have containers running um, and you want full flexibility then you are going to x86 or or our kind of world where you pay in terms of power consumption and cost as simple as that so question for clarification were you talking about the actual physical channel capacity or something to do with containers which doesn't might's not working i mean you have to talk into it yeah you have to be well, always working hardly hold it real close is it working now perhaps no. hold it close <laughs> okay were you asking about the physical channel capacity and scaling that up and down or some kind of software trick with containers? No, depending on the capacity that is needed, like number of users, active users that you need to serve, mm -hmm. you obviously use more resources or less resources. Right. And that way you control the amount of power and processing. Right. So, so that that's, kind of that's based on the number of of uh, endpoints that you're terminating, the number of carriers per endpoint, and the speed of each carrier. So if you go here on this slide again. Um, is that on? Is this on or not on? No, this this thing, right? So let's say you had a. I think the battery's dead. Let's say you had a uh, solution where the number of users is 32, and the gigabit per second is only 5 versus a solution where the number of users are 10,000 and the capacity is 30 gigabit per second. What we do is we have the same silicon. We load a different firmware to enable only this functionality on this chip. We sell it at a different price. Then we go in this market, we sell the same silicon. We enable all the functionality in the silicon and sell it at a different price. Okay. So we have kind of pay as you go model um, in the wireless infrastructure, which is also a unique one of one, ha never happened before, where you have the same silicon, but you, you pay for what you use. Actually, that's not true. I mean, Xilinx and, and uh, Altera, when they existed, you know, 15 years ago, yes. were doing custom FPGAs, which had very similar model, at least in terms of pricing. You know, you paid based on what you enabled. Yeah, but I the thing came with a certain max capacity, just like you. Correct. And they were absorbing, you know, the gross margin in within their gross margins. Correct. The that, difference. But they were doing that 15 years ago. The difference is in the power consumption. Exactly. Right. The difference. But the, 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 the ideas did exist. In wireless infrastructure, I don't know Xilinx. Not in wireless necessarily. Yeah. In yeah. different verticals. Yeah, yeah. Pay as you go model is not. We did not invent that. We implemented that for the first time in for wireless infrastructure. A lot of good questions. I didn't think this talk will be so interactive. This might be jumping ahead a little bit, but uh, if you succeeded in creating this programmability and then the way to sell it is, you know, different price through the firmware, right. isn't there, don't you feel like there's still a little bit of limitation uh, give from the RF side? The RF components are like classically very custom. It's not configurable. So do you want that world to be configurable ideally for the entire system to be to be the most optimized. Yeah. Good question. From the RF config. Please, please repeat the question. Can you speak louder? Should, should RF, <laughs> should the, I think it's should the RF components be, be programmable? Yeah, yeah. Should the RF component be programmable? Uh, good idea. Software defined radios have been talked about for the last 25, 30 years. Um, very abused term, I would say, now. <laughs> Um, very hard for RF to be pro I mean, the RF transceiver that we use are from tier one vendors, um, and they have a lot of configurability in terms of bands. They have configurability in terms of power consumption. RF front end, I would say, is not very really configurable is even yet. I mean, if you want to have a 3.5 gigahertz band, you have a certain type of power amplifier. If you want to use 2.5 gigahertz band, you have to change the power amplifier. The physical power amplifier has to be changed. So RF world had has has this problem for a long time where the bandwidth is a function of the Q, the quality factor of the RF. Um, the higher the bandwidth, the quality factor goes down. So 
that problem i don't know when it will be solved i i grew up in rf world i i, I got my training in the as rf designer by the way um so that world is 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 not making as much progress as you would have liked to see honestly but good question so where were we we were here yeah so this is um yeah another problem that we see in the small cell market which is kind of uh, denoted here is there are different kind of school of thoughts in the small cell market that where do you split uh, you split at mac physical layer or you split inside physical layer um, or you split after the pdcp uh, ericsson famously has a ericsson dot had a product called rrh radio resource set that is split very very close to rf and everything else was done in a box in the basement um, turns out that's not a very good idea because the 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 data throughput between that connection is very high because you are literally talking about symbols transmitting symbols across you know a uh, few hundred meters um so we also had this problem in addition to all the problems that you had mentioned that some of our customers saying you know i really love split 6 i think split 6 is going to bring peace to the world <laughs> <laughs> then other customer would say you know split 2 is going to be the best split 0 is going to be the best so a tiny startup how do you do that uh we kind of again made it configurable i have interface in this chip which can split this chip at fappy split 6 um where basically uh, uh there is split 6 this guy uh where an ru could be running on sq soc and this could be running somewhere in the central station on x86 processor uh we have some customers who are cutting it here we call it split 2 where the layer 1 and the mac is running on the on hq chip and this is uh, the central icu uh, also called famously called neutral host uh, market uh functions running here then we have also a bunch of customers who want to run everything on our silicon because of the power consumption reason um <clears throat> so we also gave our customers ability to cut it anywhere they want cut it not physical cut but at this logical cut can yes, you please sir. define ru cu and cu yeah ru is the radio unit right where you have uh, rf and all the layer 1 functions running into a box uh Split two is RU plus DU. DU is called distributed units unit, where the where the upper layer one and the MAC is running, and CU is the central unit or control unit, one of those two. <laughs> But it's essentially PDCP and RRC function. Okay. So again, what does CU do? CU runs PDCP and RRC, the PDCP function and the RRC function. This is the CU. So, so we also provided the interfaces. So, if you take an SQ silicon, uh, you can take the physical layer data out of split six. You can take it out of split two. You can take it out of split zero. So, we don't take sides into uh, which customer want that. My customer base is literally split into these three right now. Uh, you know, out of all the customers that I have, thirty percent or one third use this, one third use this, one third use that. The jury is still out which one is which one is the best. um depending upon the functions depending upon the use cases uh it it it, it can be either one of those uh, a lot of people are just fell in love with split 6 uh as i said they literally say this is this is going to solve the world hunger problem um so yeah that, that's also we 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 did uh, you can you can see by now uh, what kind of challenge a startup has to face right uh we cannot and kind of not do anything we have to do everything because who knows which market will go which market will go uh, and that has to be done in a very judicious way not spending hundreds of millions of dollars with the resources that you have so when you think so programmable like a java drawback like so what is the drawback i think so i couldn't hear you can you say again uh, so what about the throughput actually compared to other basics or something because your chip is so programmable so you have a Reduce throughput or something like that, but compared to other chips, so how is it? Oh, throughput. Yeah, I see. Um, actually, on throughput, we are on the higher side as compared to other silicons, um, other solutions, I would say. So the maximum throughput of this chip is 10 gigabit per second. 
uh, which is, if you are from the wireless world, it is 400 megahertz, 4 by 4. 4 by 4, MIMO, 400 megahertz. 400 megahertz. Yeah, 400 megahertz, 4 by 4. Um, the beauty is that you, if you have only 2 by 2 MIMO, then you can do 800 megahertz. So the silicon has 1600 megahertz of single layer capacity. You can use 1600 megahertz as 400 megahertz 4 by 4 or 800 megahertz 2 by 2 or 1600 megahertz 1 by 1. Uh, so all this this thing, this capacity can be chopped into any way you want. And is there any disadvantage of having the programmability? Like what is the? Is there a? Uh, disadvantage, like what is the cons of having programmable? So disadvantage. So. That's a philosophical question. So, so disadvantage of being software programmable, right? Uh, tribal knowledge says that disadvantage of software programmability is power consumption, right? We we crack that nut in HQ by using RISC five and writing custom instructions, uh, right? So, so the world we grew in. Every time you say programmability, you say okay, generic processor, generic DSP power consumption must be bad. We don't have that problem here, right? We have we are programmable but low power. So we don't see any disadvantage of programmability. We, we, we actually, that is our bread and butter. That's what we do. Now, somebody was asking, I think you were asking, um, how does this world looks? So right now, the open RAN server looks like this. You have a big honking server, which has, you know, in, fit in a rack and gazillion chips inside and hundreds of watts of power consumption. This is this world right now, open RAN world. This is a SQ solution. We have one board, and on this we have three chips. That's that. That's all you need. Uh, uh, there's no need for any any anything else. All these three chips, these are SQ SOCs. They talk to each other, and um, I think I answered it before. Less than 20 watts. Sorry? You have less than 20 watts. That's great. Yeah, this is SOC power. SOC less than, power, yeah. Yeah, less than 20 watt as compared to 300 watt. Yeah, that's very great. Yeah, yeah. So, so that is, that is uh, kind of... One ten, one tenth of what you are saying. Who are comparing yeah. against, uh, as compared to this the existing solution? And that, that what starts mattering a lot in this market, um, in three to four years roughly, the opex becomes more than your capex. So if you have invested, let's say twenty thousand dollars into capex in installing a base station, um, in three to four years you will be paying. A little more than that into to the to the PG and E electric bill because there has to be a generator, there has to be a power backup, there has to be you know uh, a fan, there has to be all of these, right? Air, air conditioning system. Air conditioning. Right? So so in three four years your apex curve will go beyond the capex curve. Well, if uh, that's the case, no one's going to buy that. Sorry? No one's going to buy that. No uh, one's going to buy a system where in two, three years, the operational expense was greater than the initial CapEx cost. Yeah, and that's why you see that Open RAN is not having a lot of, right now, I mean, a lot of challenges in Open RAN. Um, <clears throat> so, um, to summarize, at least on the technical front, what we offer, we play in these three markets that I showed earlier, right? The top one is the small cell market, the middle one is the macro cell market, and the last one is the non-terrestrial network, the satellite market, right? Um, if you open a small cell box right now, it will have at least eight silicons, separate silicon for 5G, separate for 4G, separate for 2x2, 4x4, timing sync, AI. We merge all that in one sim simple silicon, okay? So the, the time to market becomes very, very fast. Uh, you don't have to imagine for those of you who have dealt with chips and the boards, imagine making eight chips work together to find a solution. I mean, you, you, you will be spending years in lab. We have all that figured out in one silicon. Um, in this world, you will see a server like this with a bunch of um, PCI cards. We don't have none of that. We have just our silicon and all these functions is done in one silicon. Uh, this world, satellite world is also in server right now, if you go, let's say you could go to a SpaceX satellite in, in the geo orbit and see what is in there, uh, you would see a bunch of FPGAs, you will see a bunch of X86 processor. Um, that all, all of that is simplified into a solution like this. Yes, Alan. I was hoping you'd get to this in a slide, but I don't see it. We're almost at the end of your presentation. Mm -hmm. What about the system bus? That how does your base station on a chip 
play and an interface with other components within the same box for, for example, network management, monitoring, configuration, control, etc. So those, um, we have a standard interface, a standardized interface for functioning with those components in the system. Um, there is not, we don't play in that market, so to say, right? Uh, configurability, management, uh, these things are done irrespective of what RAN solution you have. So, so your base on a chip is totally self-contained. There is no system bus? No, system cost means, for example, we sell this chip and somebody has to put this box, right? Inside the box you have, um, let's see if I could go I back. I mean inside the box. Yeah, yeah. Let me go back a slide. Yeah, let's take this example, right? Um, memory, the, these are DDR memories you have to put together, right? Um, Ethernet files you have to put. Uh, Ethernet, the, the Ethernet ports somebody has to put. Um, power, power modules. Uh, this is the GPS uh, receiver. So we sell our chip to ODM and OEM partners. They make box out of it, and they sell the boxes, right? Uh, so, 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 so your OEM, ODM partners, they do all the system interfacing. Yeah. Yes, but the, keep in mind the entire RAN is running inside this chip, right? So we make the life of our ODM and OEM partners very easy. We we, we, we take full responsibility of the silicon where layer one, layer two, layer three, the entire RAN stack is running. We take full responsibility of the software stack inside that. Um, so we have made kind of the rest of the peripherals uh, system very easy because if, I, if you remember, in the next slide, I showed you a small cell solution like that. If you open a PCB of a small cell, you will see eight silicons on that, eight chips talking to each other. Um, we have only one. Of course, other peripheral components like timing circuit, Ethernet Phi, Ethernet ports, DDR memory, they all have to be put together. Well, what about network monitoring parameters? I mean, things that these eight chips might, you know, would have accumulated independently or collectively. Now you're doing it all in the ASIC. So how do you expose those parameters to your o OEM, ODM partners? Because they would need that for higher level function. That's essentially what Michelle asked is essentially what I was asking. That's why I rephrased it. Yeah, yeah. So the network parameters, for example, um, there's an OAM layer running on the same silicon, but the software is, comes from our OEM partners. Ah. Right? Um, so configurability like, let's say the OAM wants to do sell up and sell down. The OAM says, I want to tune on this frequency. The OEM says I want to use these many resources, uh, these many, this much bandwidth. All these functions and parameters are exported to the OAM layer, orchestration and management layer. And from there? Yes, from there it goes to the core network. Got it. Yeah. Um, you show uh, AI actually over there. What does it do? I mean, you know, what kind of intelligence do you have? Can you say one more time? You show AI functions. You're asking what are the AI f uh, functions yeah. and features of yeah. your SOC? Yeah. So. It's a minor chip. Yeah. So, I, I have a talk which you can see on our website. AI plus 5G. What are the commonalities and what are the what are the why AI plus 5G makes sense? Uh, there are two types of functions, two types of use cases for AI and 5G. One is what we call. Um, AI assisted by 5G, and the other is 5G assisted by AI. Uh, 5G assisted by AI is more for the communication world in the sense that, let's say you want to monitor your RF interference. Let's say your small cell is located somewhere, let's say on this ceiling, and you are monitoring the interference level during the day, and you make a model out of it um, every day after the data that you are getting. And then you run inference on that model at that, okay, on this particular day, on this particular time, uh, this machine turned on because of which my RF interference went up. Therefore, I shall tune my filter to a, a smaller frequency because I don't want to do, deal with the RF interference, right? Uh, user scheduling. You can schedule users proactively based upon your AI model. All these use cases, and you can go to our website, there's actually a talk, you can see much more detail. All these use cases have an inherent AI inferencing requirement. 
we do AI inferencing also on the RISC-V processor by extending the custom instructions. Okay, uh, something which I did not talk about because I thought you focus on the wireless part. Well, but the you, same. When you send that in the slides, just send them a link to your video on AI for 5G. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, yeah, can, it we, is, can we uh, wrap up here? Because sure. Want <laughs> yeah. Want to finish this section of the program at 4 p.m. So, so I have, um, I don't know how much, how many, maybe there are two, three, yeah, three slides more. Um, yeah, so remember I was, we were talking about some, so you, the, these three slides talk about use cases, uh, some innovative use cases that we have. Um, uh, one of them is neutral host. Uh, neutral host means, let's say there's a common RAN solution and two operator run on the same RAN network. Uh, they don't know that they are running, they are sharing RAN, um, but they feel that it is their own RAN. It is their own layer one, layer two, layer three, right? So in this example, let's say there is a MNO core network from AT&T and T-Mobile, just as an example. Uh, <clears throat> and we have a ORN split six solution uh, where both sides are SQ solution. This is where the layer one and layer two, layer three running. This is also where the layer one, layer two, layer three is running. And they are catering a bunch of T-Mobile customers as well as AT&T customers. These operators don't know that they are sharing the network, right? From neutral host uh, uh, use case, very very prominent right now. Everybody is talking about this, and everybody is deploying about deploying this. A lot of our revenue is coming from this market. So who's actually running that network? If not, neither, I mean, neither. <laughs> neither one of them. Correct, o because they o are just an overlay on that, right? Yes. OEM part, o and OEM will take ownership of this network they will sell the capacity to these MNO partners, right? So think about, let's say you, you go to Levi Stadium to watch a, base, a game, right? Uh, uh, some of you have AT&T, some of you have Verizon. Uh, there are 50,000 people sitting, your network is not working. Uh, Levi Stadium has this facility already, you might have not noticed it, but you switch to a small cell, local small cell, you don't, don't even know that you have switched. That local small cell box is being shared between different, different operators. Okay, um, that operator pays the OEM to manage that network, but as soon as you sit in that crowd, you are switched to that network and you get good coverage because use cases these days are everybody's watching game and doing Facebook Live at the same time. Um, so you cannot have 50,000 people sit and the network goes down, right? So neutral host is a very important uh, 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 use case for us. Because of the superior integration, because we provide layer one, layer two, and layer three, our time to market is super short. It's six to nine months. You take our silicon, our software, and you can make a box and go to the market. Okay. The second interesting uh, uh, use case we have is um, we have converged 5G plus wi 5G and Wi-Fi. Uh, I think in the introduction, uh, Alan, you were talking about somebody should ask me this question. You gave all the hard questions for them to ask me. Why, why 5G, why Wi-Fi? Uh, we don't think these this, this technologies are competing. We think they are complementary. Uh, the way we think about this is uh, on a factory floor, a, a human manager will always have a cell phone which will have Wi-Fi and the robot will always need 5G because of the low latency and high security need. Right? So they are complementary to each other. They are not competing. Uh, at least that's we don't see that. Now, one use case that we came up with was, uh, let's say on a factory floor or an enterprise environment like this, you have to install a bunch of small cells, right? Four small cells in this in this particular case. Uh, in a normal situation, you will run cable to each small cell, uh, a, a, a ethernet cable and a power cable. What we do is we call, we, we implement uh, 5G backhaul uh, over unlicensed band, which means now this becomes the, the key node where the ethernet is connected, and then all of them are getting wireless from this guy. So when you are installing this, you don't have to you don't have to route a wire, a cable uh, to that. Uh, particularly if it is powered or Ethernet, you just go literally take the box, put it on the ceiling. There's no wire, nothing, no no carpet need to be removed, no no nothing need to be done. That's a new way of doing a Wi-Fi hotspot. Uh, you can think of it like that. <laughs> well, I do with 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 five uh, G backhaul on uh, unlicensed spectrum. Yeah, yeah. Most most of the uh, hotspots, not all of them, use wireline. Correct. So, so this is another one which, which we are uh, uh, enabling. As you can see in the, in the end, this, these three small cells don't need a cable. They just 
you can just go put it put them without a without a cable um, and then this this uh, other use case this is the non terrestrial uh, uh, network use case the way it works is there are two actually use cases two types of use cases uh, there is of course a satellite in the sky uh, which is carrying the data and which is giving you the, the the data you you as i said you must all know starlink spacex they, they do it as of today although the data throughput is very low um, so you can have a g not be flying in the leo or geo orbits or you can have a g not be sit here on the ground but just reflect your signal from there to the users right uh, we support both models and we are working with some uh, some some tier 1 oems in this world to uh, to provide uh, internet connectivity via the via the satellite as well. Right. Uh, the, key, the there are certain key measures in this area. Just one second. Certain key uh, key functions that need to happen in this area. As you can imagine, you all come from communication world. There is a very strong Doppler in this area, right? The satellite is moving very fast. Earth is moving at a speed. Uh, the train here is must be moving. So very very high Doppler correction needs to be done, which means all these big uh, satellite companies, they also have their secret sauce for Doppler correction. Um, they want to not disclose their secret sauce to any company like HQ or anybody. So they again need programmability. We open up an API, they implement their Doppler correction algorithm onto our RISC-5 processor, and, and that's why they really like us. Um, and also keep in mind, this satellite is flying in the sky. Every milligram, every kilogram matters, right? Because the heavier the, if you if you are to send a big uh, x86 rack in the satellite, uh, in the sky, it, it will not only have power consumption problem, it will have weight problems, it will have you know, the longevity of the of the satellite itself. So so we come with a tiny chip which can do everything that a big honking server can do. Right? As of right now, I mean, they are supposedly using these big honking servers in their satellite. Yes, and and uh, they are they are not happy with the solution. I can tell you, I've, I'm working with with a lot of these companies. These big. I'm companies. actually surprised that the solution even got to the point where you could launch a satellite and have it work in the satellite. It got to a point where uh, you can have a set. You can have this. However, right now. Uh, you can see the. You can go on Star, Starling website. You can see the data throughput is very low, mm. uh, and the cost is very high. So right now, let's say you you are paying I don't know 150 dollars to Comcast or whoever you are paying to home satellite. If you want to go get satellite from the from the from the satellite, if you want to get internet from the satellite, you are talking about six seven hundred dollars per month. Per month, and and, and we, need, we, we need to stop that. And at one tenth of the we speed. Okay, we're going to stop now because we have prepared questions on this very topic for the conversation, and I don't want to usurp that. He had a question. No, no, all the questions are postponed. <laughs> we have to have some discipline here. Now, uh, we're going to take a five-minute break, but before, I want to tell you the types of questions that we have prepared, and we will not have time for them all. So I'd like, the after I tell you, the audience to vote on the types of questions that we ask, or as I, as I ask them one by one, just raise your hand if you're interested. Okay, the first one is more on this SOC technology, what it can support, how it's programmed for various different types of options and so forth. How many would be interested in that? Okay, the next one is the various markets that HQ is pursuing, such like, such as non-terrestrial networks or satellite in the sky, such as open RAN and such as 5G, blah, blah, blah. How many are interested in that? Okay. Uh, next one is HQ's journey as a startup company, how they uh, initially raised money, how they went into stealth mode, get out of stealth mode, uh, how they coordinate their engineering with their team in India. How many are interested in that? Okay, uh, and then are there any others that I missed that we're, oh, we're going to ask? One you can, take a look. You can take, ask take, more of this one. take a look at them. So for sure, we'll start. Is really is, uh, my plan. This. We'll start with the additional chip functions and programmability, 
and then we'll go into the markets such as NTN. And by the way, if you're interested, go to IEEE Tech Blog and do a search on non-terrestrial networks and you'll get 10 articles. And that market is truly in its infancy, both in terms of technology and in terms of specifications. There are no standards. There will be no standards for a very, very long time. It's just three, GP, three GPP specs, which are not complete yet. Are there any others in the list? You have the, the paper. Paper with the questions. Uh, let me get it for myself. This way. And we need to fix your mic. Uh, this, this is not really working. You know, look close to your mouth, right next to your mouth. Mike is going in and out. Can you hear me now? You have to hold it right next to your mouth. Can you hear me now? Yeah. I don't I have to scream into it. You don't, you don't have to lose questions? Yeah. Eric, give me a number like this. I think that is, let me have your stuff. This for you. Maybe use that mic. That seems to work a lot better because you, you're not going to, you're both going to be talking at the same time. You'll ask, he'll answer, and then back yeah. and forth. Well, that, this mic doesn't work. The one that I... Does this mic work? Yeah. Okay. The other one doesn't work. Okay. Oh, another one is competition. How does EdgeQ intend to compete effectively in wireless infrastructure space with merchant market players like semiconductor players like Intel, Qualcomm, uh, Marvell, uh, startups from India like Signal Chip, Sankhya Labs. One of them has a 4G base station on the chip, and how they compete with uh, captive semiconductor companies like Huawei and Samsung. How many interested in that? Okay, so I'm gonna defer that one because there wasn't as much interest. Let's take a five minute break now, and then we'll resume and get your questions. And we're gonna change the format. It was first gonna be a question, and then audience Q&A, we're going to intersperse the conversation I will have with a, a, a deal with your with your questions on that particular topic that we are addressing at that time. All right. So a five minute break, and we'll be back here at uh, four twenty three. Yeah, 
we'll keep, keep my keep my <laughs> mind flowing with the with some input and output. Yeah, let's keep it touch. Yeah, it is empty at the time. Very well. I appreciate it. A lot of detail you shared within the constraints of what you can do at this point. You know, Eric, I got a compliment for one of my tech blogs. Yeah, we'll have that's gone because he reads it every day. All right, hello, everybody, and thank you for I'll sticking you around. Just give him one second. Very welcome, but I really appreciate it. Okay, please get, uh, take your seats. Is this mic on? Yeah, this mic is not working, so we're going to have to. What was this mic on? No. This mic is not working. So uh, why, why don't you come close to me? So we're going to have to trade off mics since we only have one working. So we're going to start off with some questions about the capabilities of HQ's system on a chip. And the first one we're going to ask are how important are capabilities, on-chip capabilities like Wi-Fi, multi-carrier aggregation, asymmetric, excuse me, multi-carrier operation, asymmetric carry, carrier aggregation. Let's throw in AI for the markets HQ is pursuing. So, um, Wi-Fi. Uh, capability. Uh, the chip technically can run Wi-Fi as well because as you saw this, it's a generic modem, right? Uh, Wi-Fi does not, it's not too far from 5G when it comes to layer 1 and layer 2, layer 3. Um, we thought about implementing Wi-Fi in the silicon in terms of software, but Wi-Fi is a very kind of a bloody market in the sense that the, the cost points are very, very low. Um, the margins suck in Wi-Fi <laughs> for Wi-Fi chip vendors. Uh, it is not a good business for a startup. Um, so we chose not to go do implement Wi-Fi. Um, we decided that if you were to do 5G plus Wi-Fi in the same box, we are better off just buying a Wi-Fi chip from an existing vendor. One of our OEM partners do, did that. Uh, you can actually buy a box from one of our OEM partners, which has HQ SOC as 5G and separate Wi-Fi chip. Well, the Wi-Fi is not integrated. Wi-Fi not integrated. The networking subsystem of Wi-Fi, the networking subsystem runs on our SOC. Mm, good uh, clarification. Yeah. But, but still, we saw, I think, a very interesting back 5G, uh, uh, Wi-Fi backhaul application where we're using 5, they're using 5G unlicensed spectrum rather than wireline, which is what the Wi-Fi hotspots use. Okay, right. our, okay our next question is, what, if anything, needs to be reprogrammed in HQ's SOC to support the various 4G, 5G private network functions, like I mentioned, security, network slicing, automation, virtualization, uh, 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 and so on and so forth. These are defined by 3GPP for uh, 5G standalone network, and I think are very important for 5G private network. So, 5G private network features that you mentioned, they come uh, as a baseline feature in our silicon. Um, so there is no reprogramming required. Um, let's say a customer says, I want network slicing. So we implement network slicing and we give them software drop So you just have to select that option. Just have to select. It's a menu. <laughs> when our customers who sign up with us literally get a menu from us of the, of the features. And they can, they can click on the menu and we change the pricing based on that. And then they get the software for that feature. Quick question. So, but it's not field programmable. It is. It is not field programmable. Is that the case? So, once you've loaded the software, sold. Uh, no, it is. It is over the air programmable. Yeah, yeah. So, so because these boxes are in, gonna be in the field for like five years, seven years, right? Um, nobody knows what they will need, honestly. Uh, that is one of the problems of five G. Actually, a lot of our customers uh, tell us that. Our pain point is that 5G come with gazillion features. I don't, want to, I don't want to pay for those features on day one because I don't know where I will use them or not. Like ultra low latency, why, why should I pay for ultra low latency today? My network is not capable of that. My U is not capable of that. Why should I pay? Uh, 
that is the problem that is not solved by our competitors because they implement a feature and they shove it down your throat that buy ultra low latency from me no matter you need it or not we don't do that we say okay this is a feature it's a over the air upgrade let's say three years from now you'd ask me that hey i want to uh, in, uh, to implement ultra low latency or a symmetric carrier aggregation whatever you wrote here right uh, we give you a software drop um, you can program your box over the air and that feature is enabled as long as the hardware is in the box. For example, if you want to enable a new band, you got to have a hardware in the box. Uh, we cannot create hardware over there. But most of the software features, 90% of features that are defined in 3GPP can be upgraded over the air. But are there there will be limits to what? I mean, the feature set is probably very broad, right? So there will be a limit to which of those particular things finally can go in the chip. You, I mean, one would reach one would reach some level at which you can't implement them all, perhaps. Well, I had a deal. I hear him saying that all the 5G standalone features are already pre-programmed in the silicon, and he has a menu, drop-down menu, to select mm -hmm. them. Is that correct? Yeah, so I think your question is relevant in the sense that what you're saying is um, there are all the features in terms of there eventually you will hit limitation. The chip is capable of 10 gigabit per second throughput. Exactly. There are physical memory on the silicon and on the board. Exactly. Let's say you put 16 gigabyte of DDR memory. Um, 16 gigabyte is 16 gigabyte. It's not going to increase over the time. It's going to be there. So if you are doing over the air upgrade, you got to fit into that memory. Uh, most of our, our customers give them enough margin. Let's say they need 8 gigabyte today. They put 32 in the chip, in the box, uh, so that it becomes future proof. For next five years, they don't have to touch the box. The biggest cost in this business is if you have to roll it back. Absolutely. Right? If, if, a, if a small cell box was here on the ceiling like that, access point right, right over there, um, it is not the cost of the access point. If somebody has to fix it, um, that is more cost than the access point access cost point. itself. Absolutely. So Absolutely. it is very critical feature if somebody could do this over the air, if a truck doesn't have to roll, if, 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 if a human does not have to walk all the way and put a ladder and take this down and fix it and fix it up. You are paying more for that for that function than the, the, the box itself. Now we already you, you got on. hold on a second. I'll come back to you in a second. We've already uh, dispensed with the AI capabilities that Adil will send them the link to his video on that subject 5G AI, but let me ask you very, very briefly, when do you see AI coming to the network edge? Because right now the large uh, language models are all implemented on very high performance, high energy consuming cloud service. When do you think AI might be coming to the edge where Qualcomm and your company and others could have a more active role in implementing AI? So the Large language models have different sizes, right? For example, there's a 7 billion parameter llama, there is a 70 billion parameter llama, there is a 13 billion parameter llama model. Um, I believe in our, in our next silicon, which we are already planning, uh, we will have a, a, a capability to run at least a, a llama model on our silicon. Um, a low, low parameter llama model, right? We are never... This will be available for our customers in mid of 2026. 2026. Thank you very much. And you had a question? Yeah, regarding the over the air program ability, how do you take care of the security? The over, because, the, over the air what? Uh, over the air program ability. Because oh, over, you know, one okay. of the concerns so how, is that you know, how is you don't security want, handled on chip for over the air? Right. Somebody interfere with, like, you know, the. Uh, the access point, in, uh, infrastructure, and like, you know, uh, software. In, uh, yeah. yeah. So, so, so. That's the question, because it's 4G security and 5G security. Both have similar answer, uh, in the yeah, sense that, the um, in the sense that the chip has a secure boot. So once you turn off the cell, uh, uh, or do like a hot upgrade, um, and you send a, let's say a software package to the chip over the air, then it first gets wetted by the fuses which are there on the silicon. We have enough fuses 
to enable many software upgrades. So if there was a man in the middle, they wouldn't know if they, let's say there is a man in the middle who intercepted somehow so for their upgrade and sent software, the chip wouldn't boot. The software wouldn't boot. Um, so there is a secure boot element on the silicon which takes care of the security. So this is coming from management. Please. Correct. Well, let's talk about markets. Two years ago when we had the virtual panel session, two markets were identified. Open RAN, which then had quite a few more players than, than now, with a lot of them either going bankrupt or scaling down significantly. And the private 5G networks, and we heard today that there is another network, EdgeQ is pursuing non-terrestrial networks or satellite in the sky. Can you talk a little bit about which networks, I mean, which applications are hot now for you and which do you think will be productive and fruitful in the future? So 5G private and public networks enterprise uh, is very hot. Um, a lot of effort is being done to provide coverage inside school campuses, inside parks, inside stadiums, inside casinos, inside parking lots, uh, which typically don't have good coverage. Uh, if you walk inside a casino in Vegas, they intentionally wouldn't provide you coverage because they want you to play, right? Um, and, and so that they can earn money. <laughs> but um, now the use cases are emerging where you know, you can't live without your phone for five hours. If you inside the casino, you want to be talking to somebody, you want to be sending information. Um, so those use cases are getting pretty hot. Uh, <clears throat> that is where most of our revenue comes from. Open RAN has the challenges that I mentioned in the slide. The cost is too much. Um, you know, people people don't want to pay a lot of cost for openness. Well, it's not only the total cost of ownership; it's also the opex. So when when the carriers started promoting open RAN five years ago, the basic presumption they made was it will be the same cost I will get on openness as well. But when they realized that the cost is three X, then they started saying, Okay, do I really need openness? Maybe not. <laughs> I don't want to pay that cost, right? So open RAN has its own has its own challenges. Um, I don't see it moving very fast. A lot of companies are working on that. Um, but I don't see movement. Uh, <clears throat> carriers have not done their bit, which they were expected to do to promote open RAN. Uh, this was the best opportunity for carrier operators to inspire a lot of innovation in this market. And they chose not to. And that is the hard truth about open RAN. So I just a few more comments I'm going to make on open RAN. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but the leading semiconductor company in open RAN is Intel with their Flex RAN architecture, right? And uh, the way I see it, this is a market heading to zero. It was originally conceived as a mixed match, multi-vendor interoperability, defining all these open interfaces. But guess what? That's a thing of the past, because all the big contracts are going to a single vendor. AT&T went with Ericsson. Someone else went with Samsung. So what? <laughs> what's the rationale that for open RAN? You have any comments on that? <laughs> I'll be politically incorrect to say um, carrier operators use open RAN to negotiate with Ericsson and Nokia. <laughs> that's what they did. Actually, that's, the, that's a ploy. That's but with a 3x cost, that's not something. much of a negotiating chip, is it? So let's talk about a little bit about this uh, non-terrestrial network uh, satellite in the sky. And again, I urge you to go to IEEE Tech Block and in the search bar, write non-terrestrial network or satellite internet, you get maybe 20 articles. Uh, the next frontier in 5G, base station to sky. What is the 5G disruption anticipated here? And how might EdgeQ participate? How are you participating now? How do you see that market evolve? So, so NTN is a big market. A lot of players are playing in this. Uh, market, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars are poured into this market to fly a satellite. You can imagine to fly a satellite in the mark in the sky and into a low Earth orbit. No, right. geo as well. They are Leo and geo satellites, both. Both, both geo. Yeah, Leo and geo, both. Um, 
geosynchronous. That's 22,500 miles. That's right. So, I mean, the use case is clear, right? For example, if I at at my home, I get internet from the satellite. Uh, there will never be any disruption on that, right? Because there will never be, a, you know, a storm comes and you you lose internet connectivity and stuff like that would never happen. Nobody will ever cut the cable and run away with the cable. Um, so the use case is 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 real, proven. Um, uh, the problem with that market right now is the again. The, Economies of scale has not taken off yet, right? Um, so the cost is very high. Uh, you can, as I mentioned earlier, you can buy a Starlink uh, uh, connection right now if you go on their website. Uh, in, I mean, my home is a covered area in Starlink. I can buy it today. I have to just pay 5x of cost for one tenth of the speed, right? Uh, but this market is growing very fast. Um, we see it as actually a, a super bright spot for HQ. Because that market requires a lot of programmability. Um, ideas like, you know, as I mentioned, Doppler correction. Um, they want to typically, um, the, the SNR that you require to decipher these signals is, you know, minus 4 or minus 5 dB. These guys want to go to minus 10. Um, for those of you who work in the wireless space will know the challenges. Uh, so the signal is really, really small. Noise is very high. Uh, so you need a lot of averaging, you need a lot of mathematical operation to get those functions uh, uh, done uh, in a programmable way. And that's where HQ comes into picture because um, we are very low power, very small in terms of weight. It's just very tiny, the big of a silicon, and very low power. And they have problems with FPGAs and x86. You can imagine, right? You take a big rack like this big of a rack to fly in the sky, it's, uh, it's, it's problematic. So I see a few uh, uh, markets that you are in right now, uh, which is the enterprise private RAN and the uh, telco RAN, the uh, Wi-Fi with backhaul, and also the small cell market with this NTN market emerging. Are there any others besides NTN uh, uh, applications, configurations that you see on the horizon? Um, private and public 5G, NTN, macro. There are many other smaller applications. They are not completely orthogonal. For example, one new application that we are seeing is um, people want to run UPF of the core network inside the silicon. Um, you run UPF and you run in the entire user plane inside the silicon, then. Yeah, this user plane function. Yeah, user plane function. Um, <laughs> so, so you 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 want to run that because you re want to reduce latency. You want to reduce the data throughput that is going out of your box, so that you save on power and the cabling cost. Uh, the fact that we have a lot of compute in the silicon, uh, it generic compute based on ARM processors, um, and you can run ap different applications, uh, is very valuable. Uh, one of my customers is doing uh, you know data mining at the edge, using our ARM processors. Um, so I would say there's a lot of differentiation uh, and application that we are enabling, which could not be enabled if the silicon was not programmable. So this is a segue into the next question, is the advantages of you, that you have. Uh, currently, there are three types of competitors HQ has. One, the biggest, is the established legacy base station vendors who have their own silicon, in particular Huawei and Samsung. They have their own captive markets. The second is established semiconductor companies like Intel, Qualcomm, and Marvell, which I think are mostly in open RAN. And then the third, which I hope you can comment on, is startups that I found from India, like Signal Chip and Sanya Labs. How do you respond to who your top competitors are and is the flexibility of programmability the edge that you have in competing with those competitors? So, I mean, Ericsson, Huawei, Nokia definitely are incumbents and our competitors. Um, but they are very slow. I mean, our customers tell us 
why they are uh, going. So it speeds market, time to market, which is uh, right, right. Uh, high school size program building. Right. So, so that is something that we have won many customers who used to go with Ericsson and Nokia, particularly in small cells. Um, actually, one of the one of the companies that is a sister company of Ericsson, fully controlled by Ericsson, is working with us as well. They chose our silicon, not Ericsson silicon. I cannot disclose their name, but they are. Well, they were supposed to be here today. <laughs> Yeah, the name. I thought you could disclose the name because they were supposed to be here. Um, so, honestly, I, I don't see them as competition because I know that we have a, a, a very decisive lead over them. And they are not open, but eventually, you know, uh, in open RAN, they will get all the contracts. I, we don't have any, any, <laughs> any uh, misconception about that. Um, when it comes to Marvel and what else you said? Marvel and uh, Intel. Well, the ones that are in the RAN space are Intel, Qualcomm, and Marvel. In the in the endpoint space, 4G, 5G endpoint, yeah. MediaCom, MediaTek. Chinese company. MediaTek. There are also these grand, fabulous startup semiconductor companies from your home country, India, like Signal Chip and Sanya Labs. Mm -hmm. So, you see them as competitors. Yeah, yeah. I'll. I'll answer the, both the questions, uh, right? So Intel, Qualcomm, and Marvel. Uh, I worked at Intel for 15 years. Um, if I ask you, do you think Intel as a communication company? Uh, the answer is no, right? Uh, do you think Marvel as a... biggest failure was Wi-Fi. Do you think Marvel as a wireless communication company? Not Wi-Fi, biggest failure was Wi-Fi. Right? Um, so these companies have generic processors, um, which they sell in this market. Uh, they are very costly. They are very power hungry. Um, we have, we. I, I don't want to sound arrogant, but we don't consider them a competition in at least the private 5G market. Even the uh, Indian startups, they can I'll, I'll come to that. Um, who we do consider a competition uh, in the private 5G market is Qualcomm. Uh, Qualcomm knows how to make modems. They make how to make good modems. They, they, they know how to make good modems. Um, their focus is not infrastructure. Um, so we win a lot of customers over Qualcomm because everybody thinks Qualcomm is focused on client. Uh, they are not going to play. They are not long the horse of long race in the wireless infrastructure. Uh, but but Qualcomm is a, is a competitor. The number that I showed to you, one third of power, one half of the cost, was compared to Qualcomm. Did Qualcomm announced they're going into the real market. They announced long back. Uh, and, but but now they are also laying off a lot of <laughs> team members in the RAN. If you're in this, if you're in that, a uh, bunch of people have joined HQ actually. HQ actually. Um, when it comes to these two companies, which you said are in are in India, Sankhya Labs and and Sig Signal Chip, I heard them like five years ago. I don't hear about them anymore. Uh, I don't know what are they working on, what they do. Uh, I don't hear about them. Sankhya Labs, a few of those guys came and joined us. Um, I don't see them as competitors either. Um, from the competition perspective, we, we see Qualcomm definitely as a competitor because we know Qualcomm makes good modems. Um, and the incumbents, Ericsson, Huawei, Nokia, they all know how to make good modems. Um, they just don't want to open up. They, want, they just don't want programmability. OK, so India takes us, one of my favorite countries of all time, takes us to the next question that a significant amount of silicon engineering for your company is done in Bangalore, India. How do you coordinate the design, development, verification, test, troubleshooting of silicon between Santa Clara and Bangalore? So we have, we have actually three design centers. So one is Santa Clara, the other is San Diego, and the third is Bangalore. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, the way we do this is there's no functional split. It's not that this function is done here and that function is done uh, uh, in India. Um, there is layer one development here, platform software development here, um, uh, key algorithms are being developed here, microkernels developed here, uh, silicon engineering is done in India. Um, one of the good things that actually happened with HQ was um, a bunch of us used to work together in our previous lives uh, before we formed HQ uh, at Intel. So uh, some, of, some of the key people who were in the Intel wireless business um, 
Uh, remember, Intel was shipping modems to Apple for several generations before they shut down this business. A bunch of us used to work there. So the association and the friendship goes long way. <laughs> so <laughs> a bunch of my colleagues in India, they know what are my hot buttons and I know what are their hot buttons and how, when not to push them. So uh, yeah, it's, it's not a new team from that perspective, although HQ is only six years old, but we, have, we work together at least for more than 10 years together. But you have my opinion, having done this myself, this kind of design myself with other groups, there's a tremendous amount of system integration that you have to do to make these, all these sub-modules work together, interface and communicate, and then when you have detected a problem, resolve the problem. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, um, there are customer engineering teams who, have, who are scattered across the globe for us. Um, in terms of making all these modules work together, there are standard sets of test cases that we have. And these test cases are executed irrespective of which geos these modules are designed for. If a test doesn't pass, then it doesn't pass, and it needs to be fixed. Uh, so we don't, we don't, actually that's not um, even a, let's say, point that is discussed inside the company about these multiple geos. That, that's not a discussion at all. But you managed you manage to get the job done <laughs> Absolutely. on time and cost effectively. Right? Absolutely. We did that. Yes. Even, even uh, when your customer says, hey, there's a problem, and you have to diagnose the problem and correct it? Yeah, actually it works in our favor because um, if you think about it, we, were, we are able to work around the clock 24-7, right? Um, the customer team here, let's say the customer is here, we get a problem and the team here debugs it the whole day. In the evening, they hand it over to India and they, debug, they then debug it the rest of the day. So the clock works 24-7, so we use it for our, our advantage, not our disadvantage. All right, let's open it up to a few last questions before we close the session. From our audience, anything? Hello. Yeah, please. Yeah, I have just uh, maybe one question about your SOC design. I understand that your memory is external and uh, you don't no, use, I, I, you mentioned like, you know, like, you know, a few megabytes actually internal. But typically, you know, for, like, you know, the tensor processing unit that you mentioned, in order to be effective, it needs some sort of HPM or high bandwidth memory or something like that. Because, you know, the um, latency for accessing external memory, you know, and like, you know, doing like, you know, uh, tensor, like, you know, uh, processing, it's, uh, it's a bit actually prohibitive. Well, HPM. Are you asking about on-chip memory versus off-chip memory? Yeah, because you know they are relying on so off-chip memory. Yeah, but for, well, what about for microcode? Where's the microcode stored? The microcode, let's say that your that customer, that your customer, re your customer reprograms the channel estimation model. Where is that microcode? Is it on-chip or off-chip? So, as I mentioned, we have roughly 50 megabytes of on-chip memory. How much? 55 zero megabytes. Um, most of the code. Uh, for the, not most, all of it, the microcode, it's in that memory already. Um, when you say HBM, HBM is used in the AI function mostly uh, for, for uh, tensor execution. Uh, but the data throughput in that case, the amount of compute is an order of magnitude higher. Uh, for example, NVIDIA's latest Blackwell GPU has five petaflops of compute. Uh, to feed that beast, you need HBM. Uh, here, the compute that we are talking about is still a few tens of tops in the chip. So the AI world has gone uh, on a rocket uh, in terms of compute, and that's why they need HBM. Modern world is not HBM. I mean, if you think about it, five years ago, in 2019 or 2018, um, I used to work in the AI team at Intel, and the maximum processing power that we had was uh, around 100 tops, 100 tops. Now the maximum processing power is four petaflops, right? So five years, you can divide four petaflops with 100 tops. It's like, I think, 100 or order of 100, 100 or 1,000 magnitude, whatever, right? So AI, AI world has evolved uh, hundreds of X in those five, six years, hundreds of X or thousands of X. In 2018, um, LT data throughput was 150 megabit per second. Now you are talking about 
north of gigabit, few gigabit per second, right? So around six to seven x or ten x, let's say, right? So communication world has gone up by ten x. AI world has gone up by thousand x. So the requirement for HBM and all those things are coming into AI world, not yet into the into the modern world. We are, we, we, we still have enough memory on the chip to make sure that the latencies are not enough and we don't have to go outside to do far. Fair enough. Thank you, Adil. Thank you, audience, for attending. And I do have one request from the students. If you did enjoy today's program, please send an email to Elaine Scott, the Dean of Engineering, who I've been wrestling with for a full year to try to get a program like this scheduled. All right? And for all those uh, non-students in the audience, again, thank you for coming. Thank you for sticking around to the end. I hope you enjoyed our very special program this afternoon. Bye for now. <laughs>